small company. I, I think they do something with music. Um, and I mean, those who were here before, they, they could listen, they could see the product in use. And uh, so we will hear about Agile at Scale, their approach. And let's see what we can learn. Thanks very much and enjoy the session. Thank you. So, ich bin aus äh, Schweden und ich habe äh, Deutsch in der Schule für äh, sechs Jahre äh, gelernt. Äh, so, ich will versuchen, äh, Deutsch... No, just kidding, I, I, won't, I won't be talking. I, I do know some, some German, but uh, not, not enough for this, this topic, I'm afraid. So... Uh, the topic, tribes, squads, chapters, and guilds, agile at scale at Spotify. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will be something about those things and, and, and maybe some other things as well. Uh, my name is Joakim Sundén. I did a fairly good, good job of, of pronouncing it. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm from Sweden originally. I've worked with Spotify since 2011. Uh, but last year uh, I moved uh, together with my family of wife and four kids to, to Boston uh, in the US where we celebrate all the American holidays uh, just as if we were uh, born and raised there. This one is called Halloween, maybe, you, maybe it reached uh, Austria as well. Yeah, actually, it's funny, but uh, uh, as you may or may not know, and, and I will talk a little bit about it, we, we call our some of our department or structures for tribes, and uh, now our tribe in Boston actually was named Quest uh, after a reorg. So now we have a tribe called Quest. Uh, that's, a, that's a musical reference. I'm also the author of this book, Kanban in Action, uh, which I learned was recently uh, translated to Chinese and, and, and sold out. So if any Chinese speakers here, you can get it in Chinese. And, and also Japanese, so kind of full circle there with the Kanban. So, uh, who here knows what Spotify is? Okay, pretty much everyone, but for you who didn't raise your hand, it's, uh, it's a music streaming service. Uh, it's uh, actually founded by a, a couple of Swedish guys and uh, our, our headquarters is in Sweden. And Spotify's mission is to give people access to all the music they want all the time in a completely legal and accessible way that uh, also the, the creators can uh, uh, benefit from and make money on. Uh, it, we were founded in, in the spring of 2006, so it's a, a more, little more than a 10 year old company. We actually had Celebration X uh, last spring uh, and uh, celebrated, or this spring and celebrated our 10 year anniversary, flew everyone into Stockholm for three days of conferencing. Uh, <laughs> but we didn't launch our, our, our service until 2008, so it took almost, or more than two years actually from starting the company to, to actually producing something or uh, delivering something. And that's not because we are slow at building software, uh, but rather that's the time it took for our two founders, they, they said, say they basically lived on an airplane for the, those two years, just flying to different record companies and, and taking it from there is no chance in hell this will ever happen to actual ink on paper and, and, and got to do that. So uh, now, 10 years later, we're 100 million users. Uh, 40 million paying subscribers, uh, over 2 billion playlists have been created at Spotify. We're in 60 markets uh, and we have five development offices, Stockholm, Gothenburg, New York, uh, Boston, San Francisco. And I, I think we can actually count London now as well, so six. We're over 2,000 employees, a little bit more than 120 squads. When I joined five years ago, we were like 100 in engineering and uh, maybe 10 squads, uh, so it's, it's been uh, quite a fast growth. And I like to ask this question because I often get so funny answers, but do you know how many record labels we have uh, deals with? Yes, shout a guess. Two? Yeah. 2,000. 2,000? All of them? Good, good answer. <laughs> 
So it's actually, uh, there's always someone saying zero for some reason, but no, well, we're, we're, we're not pirates. Uh, so it's 300,000. Uh, and I like to say that because it, it, it uh, emphasizes also the complexity of uh, uh, and why we're so... How, how come you are so many people? Well, there's a bunch of people in labor relations, I'll tell you, and, and in legal and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a complicated business. So, how many of you have seen this white paper called Scaling Agile at Spotify? Okay. How many have seen the culture, engineering culture videos that we have been doing? Okay, not that many. So, uh, in 2011 I met uh, uh, a woman at the Agile uh, Sweden Unconference that I've been part of organizing in many years. And uh, uh, she worked with Spotify, which was of course known at the time, but I had no idea how they were trying to work at Spotify. I was blown away about, about what she told me. She was the first Scrum Master they hired. Uh, she had just started, but they were already doing some really interesting things. So I immediately applied for a job. Uh, so uh, I guess I, I, I recognize the feeling of, of being intrigued and, and wanting to learn more about uh, the Spotify story. And uh, a lot of peop other people started also taking an interest. And, and Henrik Knieberg, who's uh, very known in the Agile community, came in as a consultant. And he started documenting and sharing this. And, and then I've mostly been on the inside. And uh, it's... Uh, all of a sudden you keep hearing about this Spotify model that's being uh, sold and uh, uh, educated. Uh, people are, are, are educating or training others in the Spotify model. Uh, there are consultants who actually sell uh, that, that as a way of scaling Agile. That we, we've never heard about them. They've never been in touch with us. Uh, yeah, they, they call it the Spotify model. That, that's never a word that we've used internally. Well, I guess it's gone full circle and now we use it even. <laughs> but we didn't come up with it. And I, I, I've been curious what it actually means. So uh, as you might know, there are only two hard problems in software development. Naming, uh, cache invalidation and one of errors. So uh, how about starting with a definition? So, so from Oxford uh, Dictionary of English, what does model mean? Well, it could be a three-dimensional representation, a thing used as an example to follow or imitate, simplified description, person employed to display clothes by wearing them. <laughs> Pretty sure it's not that. A particular design or version of a product. I can't help to believe that a lot of people consider this is the Spotify model, a thing used as an example to follow or imitate. And, well, it seems like we're, we're a successful company, we're super big, uh, uh, everyone knows about us, uh, lots of people love the product, so we, our model of working must be great, right? Well, maybe not. There's another more fitting description, that's a simplified description of a system or process. And that's what it's always been for us. The, the, the white paper that we published was a, a snapshot, basically, of what we were doing at that time. It's now, what, four years ago, three and a half years ago. And in many cases, it was just something that we were trying to do, that we thought would work for us. And, and even when people had started reading it, we had changed and, and we were doing something different because it didn't work. And we were experimenting a lot. The, the jury was definitely out on whether we were successful or not. And uh, we wanted to do it differently from traditional companies because we, we felt that we weren't a traditional company and that we wouldn't be able to accomplish what we wanted to do if we would be doing things like others were doing it. And it just wasn't part of our culture. So when I hear people saying, we're implementing the Spotify model, uh, I, I, I'm a bit concerned because I, I don't think that they necessarily have the same culture, the same background, the same challenges, the same context as, as we do. So I, I just wanted to describe that a little bit. We are in the digital market where it's very common, especially in the music digital market, that the winner takes it all. 
there's just there's not, there's not going to be three or four Facebooks. You know, everyone's going to be on Facebook. Well, Google Plus tried, but I don't know how they're doing. But uh, yeah, in music, even more so because you know it's it's not even we, we're not even selling our own product. There there are very very small margins on on uh, selling music like like we do. So uh, you have to have a really, really, really big market to, to make this profitable in, in the long run. And we know that even, even when I interviewed for Spotify more than five years ago, I was told that our biggest competitors are Apple and Google. And they're like, they were nowhere near having a streaming service. They, they had published no plans of, of doing so whatsoever. And it actually took them much longer than we anticipated to, to start competing. In part because Apple was making a shitload of money off of iTunes, so it's very, very difficult to challenge your own uh, successful business model. But we always know that we have to be faster than anyone else. Being to make mistakes faster than anyone else is, is a, a very typical and common quote by our founder and CEO, Daniel Ek. <coughs> and that's, that's our prime directive, basically, speed. We have to be fast. That's, that's the competitive ed edge we have. We don't have Apple's money, we don't have Google's size or, 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 or data or, or their money for that matter, but we can be really, really fast. So what is maybe working for a, a Swedish startup uh, from a Swedish consensus culture with, with hundreds of millions, actually literally billions of dollars of venture capitalist funding competing against Google and Apple, might not work for, for a, I don't know, a government institution uh, with a hierarchical command and control structure that's optimizing for cost efficiency, for instance. Might just not be the same. And besides that, there's also, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Shine culture model, uh, but uh, basically you can see it as an onion slice. It's artifacts and products. That's what you can see, the external reality, the, the visible part, the, the top of the iceberg. But underneath, there's norms and values and basic assumptions. And the basic assumptions can often not even be uh, articulated by the people inside it. A quote from Shine is that these assumptions are typically so well integrated in the office dynamic that they are hard to recognize from within. So there's also, they're also even hard for us to describe. And when we would describe the Spotify model, we have, we have been struggling to, to dis, uh, describe the culture. If you're students of, of Lean and Toyota and, and TPS, you know there's a, a very similar thing. Uh, also where, where Toyota has been very, very generous in sharing exactly what they're doing with their competitors, because that's not the point. Once they go, go home and start implementing that, Toyota is already doing the next thing. So, just to set the context that this, this is a little bit where we come from and, and how we view things. So, and that's how I want to explain some of the things that we're doing from, from, from this context and, and helpful, hopefully help explain why are we doing these things and, and how, how do I believe that they are working for us while they might not be working for, for anyone. So, how, how do we stay fast while growing so quickly. Why do we grow so much to start with? Well, it's actually to stay competitive and stay fast. We have so many ideas that we want to experiment with and try and, 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 and test, so we need to be a lot of people in able to do that. And that's also, uh, I, don't, I don't know much about uh, the, how venture capital and all that works, but, but I know that no one is paying billions of dollars uh, for, to a company in order for them to turn profit. It's expected that you're going to burn the money growing and the profit will come later. So we don't even have, a, it, it, would, it would be a failure of us to actually make profit. Well, now it's maybe time, but <laughs> <laughs> during the first 10 years. We believe that one way of staying fast while growing is autonomy. Uh, this is in the words of Woody Sewell, Sewell uh, the mob programming guy. Awesome people will do awesome things when they have an opportunity to be awesome. And that's, that's it, basically. Uh, I don't believe in, in hiring awesome people and get out of their way. 
we're rather trying to hire awesome people and support them as much as we can to be even more awesome and, and leverage their awesomeness. In part because that's what's shown to be very motivating for people to have autonomy uh, and that's a way of, for us to attract great people and keep them motivated. But it's also that I mean, we don't believe that uh, a way of, of being really fast and, and making lots of different experiments and, and innovate is not to have a hierarchy that you need to traverse to make decisions. You have to have managers involved and decide things and, and, and sit in long meetings. We want people to be able to experiment and try out things. Which has led us to what we call the, the most important feature of our organization, in the words of our CTO, the autonomous squad. It should feel like a mini startup and Spotify should be like an incubator. It's a self-organizing team, cross-functional, everyone that's needed to, to, bring, something, to, to, to bring the product uh, out needs to be on the squad. So if you're uh, in the, let's say, browse team, and some of you saw I had Spotify up, it's, uh, you basically can see a homepage, uh, kind of. If you want that content to be available on Android, iOS, and desktop, and web, you have to have all those developers in the squad. Of course, we have a lot of platform and, and uh, we have a lot of uh, infrastructure and operation squads that makes the life easier uh, and, and help the, the, the feature squads, so to speak, develop. But you own everything end-to-end. -end. If something breaks, you're on call in the squad. We have operations in squads, DevOps, as some call it. So, there's also in the white paper there were a lot of things like a, a squad is always co-located, it should always be seven to nine people and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm currently working with a, a squad of 16 people uh, with engineers in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Argentina, London and Stockholm. Is it ideal? No. But uh, we've decided that mission is greater than location. We tried, uh, and I think it was interesting, Lou Coleman talked about that a little bit, like it, earlier today. How do you, you're saying, oh, everyone has to be co-located, but then again, we need to do this at scale, and we need to have the talent and the passion wherever it is, so that's a compromise. So it's funny uh, when people say that, oh no, the Spotify model says that you should or shouldn't, like, that's, there is no model saying anything. That's how, what we tried to do, uh, what we believed in at that moment in time. So, for this to work, there's something that's needed in the organization. Okay, then Warren's going to catch you. Okay, it's called the trust fall. Okay, trust fall. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Yeah, that's trust. So if, if, I would, if I would use one word to describe what's different at Spotify from, from most other workplaces I've been working at, I would say it is trust. That, that's, we really, really trust people. We, we all hopefully also communicate better than, than that. But, but. So one, one maybe silly but typical example is uh, this is the self-service tech gear at Spotify Stockholm office. You can just grab, if you need a keyboard or a mouse or adapters or, or whatever, it's just batteries, you can just grab it. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit, you can see there's price tags to so just make you aware of, of how much it, you're actually spending if you're constantly losing your keyboard or, or for some reason. <laughs> but it's... Uh, that's a, a given that, that we, we have things like that. Also, all engineers have access to all production servers. Uh, we have a travel policy that means you, you don't have to have anyone's approval to, to book a trip or a hotel. So, so I, just, uh, I just booked this trip here from Boston uh, uh, without my manager's approval or anything. It's not needed. Uh, but also, this is a quote by Don Reinerson that I really like, decentralizing control requires decentralizing both authority to make decisions and the information to make them correctly. 
And I, I don't know a more transparent company than Spotify. Everything is basically shared. We have, uh, when, when our board has earning calls with investors, it, it's transcribed and shared with the entire company. All company metrics, uh, plans on, on what we will be doing are two or three years. That's very, very secret and we don't want competitors to, to know. Everyone uh, have access to that information. And we have uh, town halls uh, every three weeks with, with all of the C-level people on stage and, and, and people asking questions, really, really bold questions. Uh, and, and the ones that they can't answer, they all, always uh, publish the answers in a document. There's also a, a culture of celebrating failure. This is one team that had a fail wall, so they actually put up all the failures they made, they, they put up a, a, a note and, and what they learned from it. Our CTO uh, is writing internal blog posts like celebrate failure. Uh, there are lots of how we shot ourselves in the foot, different uh, mistakes that, oh, I, I, I deployed something and went for lunch and when I came back, yeah, all of Spotify was down. <laughs> no. I guess I shouldn't have lunch after deploying. <laughs> Learning. Uh, so uh, we also have a, a team uh, in New York recently that started doing uh, failures, failures of the week. So at their all hands they have every week, they, uh, they, they, they share their failures and people vote and you get a, a, a silly prize <laughs> for, for the most fun. And it turns out that has been a great way to actually a more fun way to share what different squads are up to, uh, to do it like that. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Google Aristotle project where they did research over uh, several years, uh, hundreds of teams, seeing what, what are actually making the difference, uh, separating great teams for, from not so great ones. And uh, one, one of the biggest things they came out with was psychological safety. Uh, basically safe to fail. So uh, that's, that seems very important. And our CTO say also, also say things like 70%, 30% of what we're doing should be failures. Otherwise we're not innovating enough. So uh, besides being a member of a squad, which is basically your delivery team or, or scrum team, as we actually called it uh, uh, at, at one point, and that's also maybe a uh, semi-interesting story because that's the reason why we came up with squads and chapter. So chapter is basically a functional team. So if you're a web developer, you're in a web chapter. If you're a QA, you're in a QA chapter. If you're an agile coach, you're in an agile coach chapter. And that chapter is never more than 10 members, except when it is, but typically, never, typically not more than 10 members. And, uh, uh, one of the chapter members is the manager for everyone else. And typically that person, the chapter lead, is doing 50% management things and 50% some kind of individual contributor work. It could be if you're a back-end chapter lead, maybe you're doing back-end work in one squad, actual coding. Or maybe you're road managing, which is our own terminology for project management road managing uh, uh, something, uh, an initiative or something on your other time. But we used to call that the back-end team when we were small in 2011 when I joined. And the other that you were work, doing your work, we called that scrum team. But we didn't do scrum in all teams. Actually, most didn't. So it didn't make sense. So it was very confusing when people said, my team, we didn't know if they meant their back-end team or the scrum team where they were doing their work. So we basically had a, invited everyone to a big meeting in, in our big meeting room and, and brainstormed names and we came up with, oh, let's go with chapter and squad. Great. Done. Man. I, I suggested crew, but no. <laughs> right, I forgot actually, I don't know if it's big here, but in the US there's at least several brands that have this squad goals. I don't know if you've seen it. My, my 12 year old daughter actually has a t-shirt that has squad goals. I was like, what? Are they also implementing the Spotify model? 
And uh, a, a young uh, woman at work told me, apparently that's a thing on Twitter now also, squad life hashtag, and you put out pictures with you and your girlfriends. Like, but uh, I, I don't know if it's Spotify related. Maybe, maybe you tell me. So, and, and this is also a, a typical thing. In, in the chapter, you share knowledge. Uh, you try to uh, consider the, the technical dimension. Uh, like if you're a bunch of web developers, uh, in, in, in your part of the organization, or there, is there a need for, uh, for consolidation? Should we be using the same tool? Uh, you're having lunch and learns, and, and it's basically a, a small community of practice. Uh, and that's also a thing when, when uh, I met people back uh, a few years back that said, oh, we're doing the Spotify model. We also have chapters, or even after a presentation like this, we're also doing chapters. Oh, that's super cool and, and when I started talking I thought no that's that's not it and, and one really really big aspect of this is the servant leadership that's also partly by design that if you are a chapter lead and you have so you're gonna have uh, direct reports in several different squads if you are also an individual contributor you're gonna be in one of those squads but not all of them maybe there's another chapter lead in your squad so it's really, really clear that you're not the team lead because you're the manager of one web developer in your squad. You're not going to be a team lead that, that not someone will listen to, to because of your uh, positional authority or, or something like that. The chapter lead is all about growing people, developing people. It's a servant leadership role. So uh, at some point in 2012, we, we decided that we're so big, we, don't, uh, we no longer know each other, we don't know who to go to if something's broken or if we need help or a problem. Uh, I, I introduced the concept of Dunbar number, uh, from the anthropologist to Dunbar. Uh, there's a lot of research and, and a lot of uh, uh, patterns uh, throughout history that you're typically group yourselves in, in 140 or less. It's, there's some, uh, some dispute what, what the actual number is, but beyond that number, maybe between 120 and 200, uh, you actually can't have a meaningful relationship with, with more people than that in, in, in a given context. Uh, army units uh, and, and other uh, small hunter-gatherer tribes and, and so on. And that's why we chose to call it tribe. And the point was, why didn't we call it department or, or, or whatever? Well, the point was that we were becoming too small. We wanted a smaller context. We wanted this tribe thing. Now, when, when we're making this smaller context, it's going to be more clear who I can go to for help, who, know, who, does, who does what. It's to help the autonomous squads navigate and also create clearer mission containers for the tribes. So you also get the sense of, ah, this is my tribe. These are the people I need to, to deal with and interact with. So, uh, yeah, and we also have that. Ideally, chapters should never span multiple tribes because that's also a function of the chapter to make it easy for people to move within the tribes. You can basically move to another squad within the tribe without ne needing to change manager, which makes things a little bit easier. Uh, but that's also just a, a, a rule of thumb not, not a, or a guideline. So it started from we have had a really, really big technical organization. So we, we used to have the, the tribe lead. It was actually also a way of getting more senior leaders or, or uh, there's, a, there's kind of a change. Uh, when, when you're a manager for, for up to 10 engineers and, and your, your main goal is developing and growing them to when you're becoming a tribe lead, which is a lot more about uh, creating alignment and, and understanding with what the rest of the business is doing, help prioritize and, and help give a higher level context. So we needed a different type of leader for that, which is the, what we call the tribe lead. We pretty soon discovered that this shouldn't only be a technology person, which it, it was typically a director of engineering. So we said that it should be a product lead and a designer also. They all need to work together. Because before that, we kind of ended up in the delivery organization and, and someone who wanted things done from the organization, which meant we didn't collaborate and we didn't take uh, shared responsibility for it. 
And that's something we have started doing at all levels in the organization or we've been doing for a long time. We, we try to have leadership teams and trios uh, instead of, of individual leaders because we want diverse perspectives, we want all perspectives needed to, to, to be uh, having a shared responsibility. But this is a good example. We, we also said, oh, tribes should be co-located, uh, the chapters should never, and, and you know, all that. But looking at it in reality, the Music Prey tribe, already at the time, uh, it's, uh, it's both in Stockholm and Gothenburg, so it is not co-located. What's this? That's not a cross-functional team at all. It's only content too. That's a kind of back-end engineers. Well, for that squad, it's mostly it's content ingestion. All the all the tracks we ingest about twenty thousand new tracks every day into the service. They only need to have back-end developers. What's this? It's a, a QATA chapter lead and agile coach. Uh, yeah, there, there's lots of exceptions to the model. And who's this guy all on his own? Well, that's Lud, a uh, 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 genius engineer who was the first engineer at Spotify and he can do whatever he wants. So. <laughs> There's always going to be these exceptions. So we realized also when we started the tribes that, uh, uh, but what about now when we have so many backend chapters and we start separating them into tribes, who is making sure that all the backend developers in the Spotify world uh, are meeting and, and having a community of practice. So we, when we did, did that change, we said, okay, everyone's going to be in a guild too. Uh, so all backend developers are going to be in the backend guild, all web developers in the web guild, and so on. But then we said, why, why do we want to encourage that high specialization? So we said, open it up and, and you can be in any guild if you want to. And then the next question was, but what is a guild? What do we do? Uh, we don't know. You figure it out. Uh, so we said that someone should probably be responsible for bootstrapping the guild, but you'll figure it out. Uh, someone, uh, one, one, the web guild, uh, were three, three people that started doing it together in another guild, there was just one guy doing it. So they started having uh, unconferences basically, a, a full day where they met in, in Stockholm or New York and doing uh, lightning talks and uh, open space sessions and, and some social activity in the evening uh, and a mailing list and that's it. Uh, and what happened was that now there was all of a sudden a concept called guild. So people started uh, running guild, whiskey guilds, uh, continuous delivery guilds, innovation guilds. So that was a, a, a structure that just emerged and, and people started using it for all kinds of purposes. So we recently, or actually that was last year, we, we had yet another uh, level of the organization that's Alliance, that's a collection of tribes. So why don't we just call it business unit? Well, we actually have a lot of, of people that have worked in lots of other companies and, and uh, senior level people who, who would know about business units. I didn't, so I would default to, to calling it business unit. Uh, but there are differences. So the alliance basically came about uh, when, we, when we put the trios together, so we had T, P and D, uh, it also become, became much clearer how important it was to align uh, on, uh, on verticals and as, also as we grew bigger. So the alliances were actually shaped, one for revenue, which is basically our ads. Uh, and uh, as you could see, we have 100 million users and 40 million paying, so it means at least 60 million free users. So we, we have a large ad business. Uh, we have one alliance that's actually going to show it. The, uh, the consumer alliance, the creator alliance, the revenue alliance. We, we organized according to those three vertical missions uh, with a, a single customer in, in focus. Then we pretty quickly found out, whoa, that's a really big uh, group of people. That's like three or four hundred. So uh, it, it really didn't work. So we reorganized and did more alliances that were smaller, but still with a collection of tribes. So, uh, 
I don't have that much more to say about alliances at the moment, but we'll, we'll maybe learn more as, as we go. It's, it has increased the, the focus of... Uh, it, it's, or what it has done is to make it easier to, to deliver a certain kind of, of uh, cross-cutting projects, actually, in the organization. But the point is, we have a lot of levels of hierarchy, you could say. There's uh, squads and chapters and tribes and alliances, and then there's functions, and then there's a company. Uh, still, people perceive Spotify, they often use the term flat hierarchy or no hierarchy. But looking at the chart, it seems like there are so many levels, uh, especially in parts of the product organization, there are even more levels. But it's because it's it's not a reporting structure, we call it a supporting structure. And it's very, very clear that... Ah, okay, I have colors on mine. Do you see colors? Okay, those are red. <laughs> well, the, 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 the ones on the top are, are contributors and the others are managers supporting those. You don't have to, to traverse the hierarchy. You, to get something done, you don't ask your manager who asks a manager who asks and so on. You just interact directly with whoever you need to, to get the work done. So it's more of a network organization and it's an open source model. So if you ask someone and you can't get them to change what you need, or you can do it yourself and they'll, uh, they'll review your work and, and, uh, and accept it. So, uh, but how do we actually coordinate or align everyone? We're still one company with, with one mission to pursue. So there's often uh, this uh, idea that this is a dichotomy, alignment and autonomy. It's either do what I say, alignment, or autonomy, do whatever. But we believe that's a false dichotomy uh, and, and building on the work of Stephen Bunge and others, for instance, which uh, this model is, get, uh, is uh, from. So you could have, if you have a high autonomy uh, but low alignment, you have an entrepreneurial organization but with a very chaotic culture. Uh, high alignment, we need to cross the river, build a bridge. Uh, what, here is where we want to be. You know, an innovative organization, collaborative culture, we need to cross the river, figure out how. And we sometimes end up here, you know, hope someone is working on the river problem. So we're constantly evaluating tools for how can we get better at creating alignment. Uh, autonomy enables emergence towards shared purpose, as one of my colleagues put it. <laughs> So what does that shared purpose look like? Well, we used to have something called OKRs that some of you probably are familiar with, uh, Objectives and Key Results. It's used by Google. Uh, I think it was started, started by Intel. So it's basically every quarter you have an objective. The objective can stay over uh, many quarters. That, that could be a, like a, a, it should be an inspirational, aspirational goal. That's not quantifiable necessary. But the key results, you often have like maybe you have three to five object objectives and the key results, uh, three to five key results for each objective, and those should be so called so called smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely, uh, and it should be basically you should be able to say between a zero and one, is this done or isn't it done? And we figure out that that kind of quarterly batching didn't fit us. We were doing it for years, but it, it created kind of a stop-start thing. Uh, so every quarter, uh, most people wanted to come up with new things, uh, you know, especially if you didn't reach it. And we, we, the one part of OKRs is it should be stretch goals and aspirational. So you're going to miss a few of them, and then, but you may, might not want to drop them, so you kind of carry them over into the, yeah, you know, you probably know the problems. It's like with sprints when you don't uh, uh, when you don't finish a sprint before you start the next one. So it didn't really work for us. We, so we came up with our own thing, of course, uh, which is a combination of two models: the Spotify rhythm and priorities and achievements. So we have bets at the company level, and uh, two times a year we have strategy days, 
uh, one where we actually look into changing the strategy and one where we, or if the strategy needs changing, uh, ideally it doesn't need changing that often, but w and one smaller on the uh, other side of the year where we do minor changes if needed, but no, nothing big. And then we have product days every six months and we, we have a hack week before that, so we have a hack week twice a year. Uh, so for one week, everyone in the company, no matter where you work, uh, you do a hack week. Uh, you don't have to, uh, but with, with from, from each hack week we try to encourage more and more people, uh, even in marketing and legal and, and so on. Uh, actually, customer service is probably the biggest group who's, mo who's most passionate about hack week, uh, even more so than, than engineers. I think in part because they have first-hand user uh, relationship and, and they get lots of ideas that they get passionate uh, about from that. So we kind of use that hack week to innovate and get ideas that will inform uh, our plans for the next uh, quarter or two. Then we have prioritization uh, workshops with TPD, yeah, that's technology, product and design. That's basically what we call our R&D or product development organization. And then this boils down to priorities and achievements, as we call it, on squad level. The thing is, though, that when we roll this out, uh, typically uh, when we roll things out, it's like here's uh, company operations uh, now has this idea on how we're supposed to work. At the high levels, it's often immediately implemented, but then in squads, they're like, what's this? No, no, thank you. We're, we're just going to go on, do what we've been doing all the time. So it didn't really catch on. So I was involved in research and understanding why, why does it catch, catch on in some instances and why not in others, mostly not. And we suggested some changes as well, and we we're going to do the second reroll. Then we said, you know what, do we really need to mandate this at this level? Probably not, so we just scratched all of it. So now we only have the Spotify rhythm. So we used to use OKRs and prayers and achievements, and, and now it's only the Spotify rhythm. But here's a twist. Since a month back, we're taking OKRs back again. Uh, so now we're doing OKRs and the Spotify rhythm or Spotify bets. Uh, we, we're doing OKRs on the TPD level. And why am I telling you all this in this excruciating detail? Well, it's also to show that we're we're just figuring things out as we go, we're changing, we're adapting, we're trying new things. Some of them work out, some of them don't. That's, uh, that's uh, how it's always going to be. But briefly, the Spotify rhythm is also, we have company beliefs that are set by Daniel Ek and the lead team, which leads to North Star goals. Uh, I see I've dropped some texts here. Uh, and from the bottom up, it's both top down and bottom up. We, we generate data, which leads us to insights, which leads us to beliefs, which leads us to make bets. And this is uh, where they meet and become actual company bets. So that's a system that we use called DIBS. Uh, so it's data, insights, beliefs and bets. Everything you want to do on, on a, that, re that requires more resources than, than you have in your tribe and other people, it needs to be phrased as a bet which needs to be based on a belief, which is based on an insight, which comes from data, and a metric. What does success look like for, for people who prioritize this to understand uh, the, the value of it? So then we have a big Kanban board kind of for the company, uh, with company bets in now, as we're currently being uh, rolled out or productized, then there's a lot of people working on it to get it shipped. In the next, well, sorry, the later, that's problems we're exploring. We're, we're, we're kind of exploring the problem space. And if we decide that that's something that we, we, is worth doing, we start uh, exploring a solution. And once we've settled on a solution, we move it into now where we productify it. And there's a big deck, you can read everything about the bet, like data, insights, beliefs, bets, metrics, uh, the cost of delay of not doing it, uh, direct revenue or cost saving opportunities, brand pos positioning, etc. And every time there's a, a review meeting, a new deck with updates is sent out, transparent, and, and for, for everyone to, to see and learn from. And this kind of trickles down, so tribes have their own bets, some don't just call it something else, squads 
maybe one, maybe some squads call it bets, but a lot of them just do epics or stories or work items. And again, at this level, we don't really mandate anything. We, we often try to operate like this is the outcome we're trying to achieve. Here's some things that you could be doing if you don't have a better way of doing it. If you have a better way, awesome. I'll just go ahead. And then we do, uh, that's a tactic to reach the strategy of the bet. We do uh, taps every six weeks typically. We started doing so. Ogre is uh, the TPD leads. Oscar, Gustav, and Rochelle. And incidentally, it's Ogre. Uh, some, some, well, some people think about uh, the troll, what's his name? Shrek. No, but they're really more. They're, they're kind like him. So uh, uh, they do a tap with each tribe every six weeks and look, how are the OKRs doing? How are the company bets doing? How is the org health? How are all the, all the things that you're accountable for in your tribe? How are they doing? So tribe leads in turn do, do uh, taps and check-ins with their teams, with each squad, and making sure that all milestones needed to deliver on company bets are, are, are on, on track. Okay, so that was a, a, a little bit uh, about uh, alignment. I'm going to pretty quick, abruptly end here with uh, just this uh, little comic. Catbird, evil director of human resources. We're jumping on the fad of giving employees unlimited vacation days. The only gating factor would be the knowledge that taking any time off whatsoever will torpedo your career. So now our vacations will be a source of stress. Only as much as you want. It's totally up to you. <laughs> And so this is an example then of, of oh, that seems to be a, a cool practice that uh, Silicon Valley companies are doing. Let's do that we too. But if you not have the value and beliefs and the culture in place to really make it happen, it doesn't matter how much you, you sound like uh, you, you do. Uh, it's, it's not going to work for you. So it's been uh, echoed earlier today, but... Uh, does anyone know who this man was? Taichi Ono, yeah, the, the father of the Toyota production system. Uh, and this quote by him uh, reflects what we aspire to and, and, and very often how we, how we do work. This is where our model uh, came from and, and this is how it lives and, and evolves. Stop trying to borrow wisdom and think for yourself. Face your difficulties and think and think and think and solve your problems yourself. And uh, I hope we can be an inspiration for people to solve their problems. But think and think and think and solve your problems yourself. Thank you.